Welcome back to the Surf Mastery Podcast. I am your host, Michael Frampton. Today's guest is Holly Beck. Holly is a former professional competitive surfer, and for the last 11 years, she's been running the Surf with Amigas Women's Yoga and Surfing Retreat in Central America. Uh, Holly's always had an interest in the science and practice of surf therapy, and she recently completed a master's in counseling and is now a licensed therapist and is combining the two, both uh, holistic surf coaching and talk therapy. So very interesting conversation with Holly. I want to thank and acknowledge Holly for her uh, honesty and openness in this conversation. And without further ado, here is my talk with Holly. So whereabouts are you right this minute? I'm in Pavones. Where's that? Pavones? You don't know the wave, Pavones? It's in southern Costa Rica. It's the second longest left in the world. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think they they say that Chicama is the longest in Peru and Pavones is number two. But yeah, it's, it's basically as far as you can go south in Costa Rica. And there are a few really nice left point breaks. Is that the same place where you did the video about reading waves? It is. Yeah, that's not the same wave, but it is. That's that wave is like literally right across the street from my house. That looks like a very long wave as well. It is. Yeah, it can be. It needs swell. That wave needs swell. It's like flat today, but when there's swell, then it's really good. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for taking the time to to do the show. That's awesome. Yeah, stoked. So tell me, what are you most excited and passionate about in the surfing world at the moment? What a, what a great question. I am most excited and passionate about taking surf coaching beyond just the physical, mechanical parts of riding waves and looking at the things that go on in our minds and in our bodies subconsciously or somewhat consciously, the self-talk that we have to ourselves and the emotions and how that impacts our experience out in the ocean, both our own experience and our interaction with others. And uh, kind of drawing those connections and raising people's awareness of how much of a factor that can be. A factor in terms of your, your surfing, you mean? Yeah, in terms of your surfing, in terms of the whole way that you approach surfing. From the spot that you choose to surf, the surfboard you choose to ride, your goals in surfing, your interactions with other humans in the water, where you choose to sit in the lineup. Um, and then also like your own surfing. I, I think that the, the mental and emotional aspect plays a huge part that people don't, people don't really focus on, or at least I haven't seen as much of a focus on outside of maybe like competitors, like competitors at the elite level. Yeah. Their coach is probably going to teach them some like breathing techniques or, you know, calming techniques, but for the average surfer, I don't think that having like an intentional surf practice is something that most people are doing. And I feel like it can just like only enhance your surfing, both from a performance and then also an enjoyment standpoint. Oh yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Like when I, when I was surf coaching in, in California, my surf coaching turned more into surf guiding where the, so I would just go surfing with the surfers. And always, always if someone hesitated on a wave, um, as soon as I saw them hesitate to take a wave that I had clearly described, hey, take that wave, I would always ask, well, where else in your life are you hesitating? And that would always open up the question to be a lot deeper than, than just surfing. Because um, I've always thought that, you know, art, the surfing is an art and art reflects life and life reflects art. So that's great that you're digging uh, deeper into that. Is that sort of through the, the surf therapy world, correct? Yeah, definitely. I think that that example that you gave is just like so perfect because, and that's, that's where it's like goes beyond surfing. It's not just like, like, okay, let's identify the reasons that you didn't paddle for that wave. Was it because you were afraid of hurting yourself? Was it because you were afraid of falling and other people seeing that? So essentially like a, a fear of failure. Was it because you're worried about like getting in someone's way? So it's almost like that inability to, you know, have self-worth and take up space and feel that you deserve that wave. And, and I feel like it's interesting to kind of identify those things. And then if you can get to the root of why it was, then you can sort of work on that 
to have the person be more likely to catch more waves, but then also them learning that tool in the context of surfing can then, in theory, help them in the other parts of their life, in their family, in their job, in their relationships, where probably some of those same themes are at play. Yeah, definitely. I guess if they didn't feel uh, worthy of that wave, because perhaps someone else was looking at that wave too, even though it was their turn, maybe they're less likely to to pitch a deal in the business world, because perhaps someone who's been in business longer, they feel is more worthy of that business deal. Yeah, or even like speaking up, you know, feeling like you, I think it's a lot to do with like taking up space. And, uh, you know, I've primarily been working with women and I feel like in general, that is something that I see too, of, of like, especially in like a male space, you know, surfing obviously is changing so much. And now certain places, there may be just as many women or more women, but it still feels like kind of a male dominated space. So like as a female paddling out into a group of men, you know, maybe there's that kind of like, oh, well, I'm the girl out here and, and that like fear of kind of like taking up space in that environment that then can play in in, in a relationship, in a family and at work as well. Yeah. And should, do you find that clients are willing to to open up on both levels or does how long does that take? Like typically you're doing retreats. Like, is that, is that why they're a week long? Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the person. In, in some cases, you know, people are very self-aware and it doesn't take much to point it out. And they're like, oh my gosh, you're right. Like I can see the parallels and just asking that question, you know, where other, what other parts of your life are you reacting in this way? And then they're all of a sudden they're like drawing these connections. And then other people maybe are a little bit more resistant or like, oh, I don't know. I, I'm, I don't do that in other parts of my life. But I think for the most part, people are really, are really open to it. I mean, fixing it is a whole nother step, you know, that takes longer, but I think just, uh, just drawing the awareness typically doesn't, doesn't take that much time. Yeah. Now, is this something that you noticed within your own surfing? You know, not at first. I think I've noticed it more in, in seeing other people. I mean, I, I was a professional surfer and then I started uh, women's surf and yoga retreats. And so I've spent the last 12 years doing surf coaching basically for women. Oh, you know, over the course of a week where you actually get to know the person. It's not just like a one-off coaching session where you meet up at the beach and you coach them and then you go off, you know, it's like, I'm actually spending a week with them. So over dinner or drinks or whatever, I'm hearing their story. And I started to notice parallels. I started to notice the woman that like would always would go for it and then suddenly would feel fear and back off, you know, or even the opposite, the one whose default reaction in times of fear was just to like barrel ahead, no matter what was happening. And then I would hear their story and kind of go, wow, I see, I'm, I'm noticing parallels here. I'm noticing as they talk about their jobs or their relationships or their family dynamic, like then I see that same personality out in the water and and like it was a different series of events that led me to pursue a master's in counseling. I've been living in Central America and I split up from my husband and he moved back to California and we have kids that need school. And there are all these things that kind of led me to go, OK, I need to move back to California. What am I going to do with myself? I'm interested in counseling. I had a psychology undergraduate degree and a lot of like family history trauma stuff that I was interested in kind of exploring more in my own self and also to try and understand those around me better. That was what really put me in that direction. And it wasn't until I was really doing it and I discovered that there is such a thing as surf therapy because I didn't even know about that. I mean, I knew that, you know, I go in the ocean and I come out feeling better like that. I think and most surfers feel that, you know, he doesn't take a master's degree to, to learn that you go in the ocean and you come out feeling better. Um, but in actually learning the science behind trauma and depression and, and that surf therapy exists and it's an evidence-based treatment modality. I was like, yes, this is perfect. And I spent the last year in completing my master's program. I had to get, you know, hours, volunteer hours. So I spent the last year as an intern with the Groundswell Community Project, which is a surf therapy organization. And it's been really interesting. But but something that's been really interesting to me, actually, is that surf therapy has primarily been done for people who don't surf. So autistic kids, veterans, people like that. 
that that for them just going to the ocean is is part of the healing and and so most of the surf therapy like you know in doing the master's program I had to write all these papers and so of course I was like writing papers on surf therapy as much as I could because I was interested in it and so it made it more fun to write this paper so I like researched all the you know the literature out there of all the studies that have been done on the efficacy of surf therapy and almost without failure they're all done on people that had never surfed before so like you know substance abuse people who were recovering from substance abuse or war-torn children in Sierra Leone you know and and so it's hard to separate out well is it is it just the going to the ocean that's the healing part or is it actually someone who is already has a surf practice and then just approaching that practice more intentionally more mindfully like can that also be effective and so over the last year that's what i've been really focused on exploring is taking the surf therapy curriculum and kind of growing it up and and making it be for people who already surf that aren't just learning to surf and applying it to their experience as well. Yeah. Well, wow, there's a lot there. Um when you really get down to why someone started surfing and why they surf, it's not because it's a sport. It's because that they need that that therapeutic aspect of surfing more than they need the exercise or the pastime. Let me ask, when, when was your first wave and what was the main reason that drew you into surfing? Uh, I always loved the water. I was a water baby. I, my parents had a hard time getting me out of the pool. But And even though I grew up in a coastal community, we didn't live right at the beach and my parents weren't beach people. So I didn't really spend much time at the beach growing up other than with like friends, families. And I remember boogie boarding in the summertime with friends when I was, I was probably pretty young. I was probably in elementary school or, you know, early junior high when I was old enough to be like allowed to go to the beach with friends, parents. And I just loved it right away. But my mom was very old fashioned, very like girls need to be on the beach looking cute in a bikini, not out competing in the boys. Like keep in mind, this was in the early nineties. It was before blue crush and Roxy and the whole like women surfing media movement in those days, you know, her perspective was that girls didn't surf. That's what, that was for boys. And I was a super tomboy. So like from my, you know, earliest memories, my mom and I were butting heads because I wanted to play soccer and I wanted to wear shorts and I wanted to climb trees. And as the oldest girl, she really wanted me to be like her little doll that, you know, did ballet and played piano. And, you know, the most athletic thing I was allowed to do was horseback ride, which was great. Thank thank thankful for that but still so yeah when I finally discovered surfing I think I was probably in seventh or eighth grade and I was like oh my god I want to be a surfer and she was like no 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 that's for boys um so it took me until I was 14 to kind of save up babysitting money and find a surfboard at a garage sale and even then she was like well you're not allowed to go yeah okay you bought the surfboard but you're not allowed to use it so I had to keep it at a friend's house and kind of lie about where I was going. Um, but eventually I was, you know, a teenager and I was old enough to be like, well, I'm doing this. And um, then, yeah, it was my first wave, like on a surfboard, like standing and riding was incredibly memorable because it was like the culmination of something that I had been wanting for years and had been told I wasn't allowed to do it because I was a girl. And so and and looking around in the water like there weren't other girls. You know, it, so it kind of like she was telling me it's for it's not for girls. And then I would go to the beach and there weren't any other girls. So it was hard to kind of argue that. But ultimately, I was like, well, I don't care because I'm going to be the one. What did that first wave mean to you? Yeah, it was just it was freedom. You know, it was it was kind of this feeling of like, I can do anything. I asked for this and I was told no and I fought and worked and whatever. And, you know, I don't necessarily remember all the whitewash waves, but I do remember the first green wave I got, like the first down the line, like riding along the face of the wave, surfing wave, like that's the one that's memorable. And it really was this feeling of like, yes, like I did this. I persisted and I got it. And yes. Freedom from what? Freedom from 
from all of the expectations, from all of the pressure that I felt at home to be a certain thing. Like in order to have acceptance at home, you know, I needed to get straight A's and I needed to be feminine and girly and, you know, not make too much noise and and just fit into this mold that, you know, my parents could be proud of and show me off to their friends. It was very like they were like, this is how you're going to be in order to be accepted in this family. And it was like, I mean, I was always a nerd, so getting good grades wasn't that hard, but like all of the other things were really hard for me to fit into. And so it was, it was like, you know, feeling like there's something wrong with me because I want all of these things that I'm told I shouldn't want and I can't actually have. So all of a sudden I had like gotten this wave and it was like, okay, I don't care. You know, and I did care. Of course, I cared. It was still like in there, like, oh, I'm doing something wrong. But it was kind of just like, well, this is worth it. Like, it's worth it. I can be myself and this feeling is worth it. Yeah. So even back then, it was very therapeutic. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, And throughout my, you know, high school years, and that was my escape. You know, it was like as long as I... As long as I went surfing in the morning, it, nothing else really mattered. You know, I could come home and deal with the family life that wasn't super comfortable, but it was okay because I had gotten my surfing. As I was lucky that my high school had a surf team and I was able to sign up for it. And then all of a sudden it was a class. So she couldn't say I couldn't go. <laughs> Maybe I couldn't go on the weekends, but like I, I was actually for school. I was like, I have to go. It's participant, participation based, my grade. So you can't tell me I can't go because I have to go and it's a grade. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and you finding similar reasons that your clients started surfing as an escape for a sense of freedom and I think I think now I mean the surfing as women surfing has changed so much since those days but in in general I, I think it's yeah I think it goes across the board I think like people like women in their forties that's like they see the imagery and it's like a bucket list thing and they're kind of like I'm gonna do that. So I don't know if it's necessarily freedom as much as maybe empowerment. Like I'm going to do this hard thing. Like surfing is hard. It's hard to learn how to surf. It's not just like, oh, I'm just going to go casually play pickleball. You know, it's like it's such a hard thing that if you're really going to do like you have to dedicate time to and then it's frustrating and it's cold and it's uncomfortable and it's crowded and all the things like you have to really want it. And and then if you then get success, there's this feeling of like empowerment, like I did this hard thing and that feels good. And I think just being out in nature too, like people do it, people keep doing it because you're outside and your your phone is, you're not looking at your phone, you know, you're, you're not getting emails unless you got one of those fancy watches, but. Yeah, some people are. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it's, I mean, surfing is, it's damn hard. It's, it's so hard. But it's, I think, yeah, one of the biggest reasons we keep going back to it is the therapeutic aspects. Now, obviously, a lot of people aren't aware of that. It's just this draw that they feel to, sometimes you just go surfing and you don't even catch any waves. And it was, you never regret that. Right. Sometimes it's hard it's hard to put the wetsuit on, etc. But I don't think I've ever regretted, you know, paddling out and, and even if I didn't catch waves, because it's that connection with nature and that therapeutic aspect of surfing. Yeah, for sure. It's like the you know the negative ions and the being in nature and the sounds. I feel like one of the things that I like most about it, as far as like the therapeutic aspect, is that you have to be present. You have to be like as you're entering the water, it's like all of your senses are activated, like the feeling of the sand or the rocks or whatever it is under your feet and the feeling of the water and the sound of the waves and the smell of the sea kelp or, you know, the salt water or whatever, like all of your senses are activated. And if if you you know, sometimes the waves are small and mellow and you can kind of drift out there and be lost in your thoughts. But you know, the most of the time, so you have to be focused because as soon as you take your, your focus away from the present moment, like the wave knocks you over, the set takes you out from behind. And even when you're riding the wave, it's like people say, oh, you, you know, you get lost in the moment of flow because you have to pay attention to what's happening right there in front of you or else you've blown it. And, you know, a lot of things don't require that kind of presence. And so surfing, it makes it really easy, I feel like, to get into that flow state because, because of all those elements. Yes. Is that why surfing is considered therapeutic? 
think there's multiple reasons, but I, I think that that is a big one. It's like the, the fact that it's activating all of your senses in that way and it's dynamic, it's moving, like as opposed to other things. You know, like any, I think any sport that you're passionate about can be therapeutic. You know, people who love tennis, like they find their therapy by going out there and, you know, hitting the ball around or people that go to the gym, like they, the gym becomes their therapy. So it's not like surfing is unique in that sense that it's, that it's the only thing that's therapeutic. But I think it goes further than those other things because of the dynamic environment. You know, even opposed to like snowboarding, like the mountain isn't moving unless it's the avalanche chasing you, you know, but for the most part, the mountain is static. So surfing just has that extra element in that it's constantly moving, it's constantly changing. Every wave is different. You never know what you're gonna get. You have to really be fully present. You can't be like, okay, I'm gonna go plan my run and I'm gonna go hit that jump or that, you know, bank just like I did the last time. It's like every single wave is different and constantly changing. Yeah, there's no there's no war veterans tennis therapy. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, that, that, that's you're right. Because surfing is that's one of the most exciting parts about surfing, is it is always different, and frustrating, exciting and frustrating. The, the love and hate, right? I just want that wave over again. I blew it. <laughs> I wish the waves were like they were yesterday. You should have been here yesterday. Yeah, but that's I, I think for me at least that's what brings me back. Because like if I'm frustrated, I turn up to the forecast said it's four foot. I turn up and it's half a foot. And I, okay, I actually, if I really think about it, I actually want to learn how to ride half foot waves because I've seen pros, you know, tear the bag out of tiny little waves. And how do they do that? It's, all, it's obviously it's possible. I'm more likely to grab my 11 foot glider and, and just catch them. But, it, <laughs> you know, it, it, it does, once you're standing up and you're on that tiny little wave, you know, all the frustration disappears and you all of a sudden you're immersed and, you know, you feel the glide and, um, it takes that frustration away. I think that's one of the beauties of surfing. For some people, though, I mean, you must have seen people out surfing that get really frustrated, right? That get angry at the waves, that are like, bah! you know, kick out of the wave, like, bah! and are angry. Is, okay, is surfing therapeutic for that person? I don't know. I think it, it could be a way to introduce therapy because that's the type of person that maybe might be resistant to actual therapy. But then if you talk to them about surfing, it's like, wow, I, I noticed that you're showing anger right now. Like, tell me about that. Where is that? What are you angry about? Where is that anger coming from? How does that feel in your body? You know, and then if you can, do you think that that's helpful to you? How is that making you appear to other people? Like whatever it works for that individual to actually look at the anger and then think about where is that coming from? Like their anger, they're probably having anger in other parts of their life, but they don't feel like they're able to express that anger. So then they express it in the ocean. So then it becomes this tool for talking about those emotions. Yeah, and they could even be twice as angry in other parts of their lives and surfing is actually less angry for them. Yeah, right. We don't, we, we don't know their story, you know. You've had some pretty um, challenging times recently as well. You mentioned a relationship breakup with the father of your children. That's pretty intense. Yeah, it was the, the process was intense, but it was the right thing to do. It was like, I think, I think for me, it's actually surfing was involved. <laughs> surfing was involved because part of the issue in our relationship was that I need to go surfing. <laughs> Like it's like a, it's a need, you know, like for me, it is my therapy. And like I was saying before, as long as I go surfing, I'm cool. You know, I can, I can deal with a lot of things as long as I get that minute to myself to go surfing. And when we had children, um, that became a big problem because all of a sudden I didn't have the ability to go surfing because I got babies. I, at first I was pregnant you know, and then I've got this tiny baby and in our relationship there, the, I, the taking care of the children really fell on me. And, and when I needed him to be like, I see that you need to go surfing. Let me take the kids and go, just go take an hour. Like those were the things that I really needed. And instead I was kind of made to feel like I had a problem. It was like, I was, it was put in the phrase of like, you have a, you were addicted 
and this is a problem and you need to figure it out. And there was a long time where I was like, maybe he's right. I do have a problem. I'm a serving addict. Like, how am I going to deal with this? And eventually, once the kids got old enough that I was kind of separate from them a little bit and had a little time to myself, I realized that, no, it's, I don't actually, I know, I know now the definition of addiction, and that isn't the problem. It is just my thing that I am passionate about that makes me feel better. And, and that was what I needed that I wasn't getting. Obviously, there was a lot of other things, but that was really, that was really the thing that made it hard to tolerate all of the other things. But the, the, the funny thing, or not really funny, the ironic thing, I should say, is that after we broke up, then, you know, the children have been living with me. So now it's even harder to go surfing sometimes because as the, as the single mom, it can be challenging to get the time to go surfing. But luckily, the kids are now old enough that they're starting to surf themselves a little bit. So that makes it easier. Yeah, and I can relate to a lot of that. The mother of my children left. So I can relate to that. I know what it's like to lose the, the family dynamic. Do you think that it stems from childhood? Like he wanted that control over you and you're, and it sounds like your parents did too. Yeah, I, I, I really do think that that's it. And that is, is one of the reasons why I think I stayed in the relationship as long as I did was that feeling of like, I have to do this thing for somebody else. Like I can't be true to myself and he's a great guy in a lot of ways, obviously. And we are, I'm very lucky that we actually co-parent pretty well. We're both a lot happier separate. And we finally got into that place after three years of, um, some struggle, but, um, but yeah, looking back on the choices that I made to choose him. Well, plus I was living in Nicaragua and there's just a really shallow dating pool down there. <laughs> and, I wanted to live there and I wanted to have children and this guy that was like age appropriate and willing to live there and have children showed up and I was like, okay, you'll do. And, and he actually, he actually wasn't a very good surfer and I had come like we, we met right as I was quitting pro surfing. So like up until that point in my life, like the, the previous 10 years, one's self-worth was all dependent on how good you surfed. I mean, that's the surf industry, you know, it's just like all about like how hot you are and how shredding, you know, how'd you do in the contest? Did you get in the magazines? Who's your sponsor? Like self-worth is just like, you know, it's a struggle. And, and so when I met him and surfing wasn't his whole life, it would, that was almost attractive at first. Cause I was like, Oh, you're different. You surf, you like to surf, but you're not obsessed with surfing. Like how refreshing, this is so different than everyone else I've been with. And then once I realized, like, ooh, he's just really not that good of a surfer. And he doesn't understand etiquette. And, uh, you know, I was like, what have I done? Like, I, I'm, like, now committed to this guy. And we're living together in Nicaragua. And he's a kook. Like, oh, my God. And, you know, I had to do all this self-talk. of like, it's okay. I'm not that shallow. It's not all about surfing. Like, it's fine. It's great that he has other passions. And I can have my thing and he can have his thing. And... We don't have to surf the same spots together and I don't have to be attracted to him in the water. But, you know, it turns out I am that shallow and <laughs> surfing is that important. And it's... It... Maybe, but I, I feel there's a little bit more to it than that because it sounds like he wasn't accepting of your need to go surfing. That's and maybe true. if he would, was actually accepting of it and let you go surfing, not only would it have been have your escape from everything else, but your, you know, surfing might have been your escape from him as well. It's true. If he was trying to keep that control, controlling aspect that reminds you of your childhood, and that's what you, that's what drew you to surfing in the first place. It's interesting because it's it, directly to what we were talking about before. It's you know, surfing is so is a reflection of you know your relationship to your job, and there, right there, it is. Yeah, and it's, it's I feel like it's if if we can, um, I mean that's what therapy is, right? It's it's, it's self awareness, and then also I've done a lot of therapy too. So in in my experience, the therapy has been self awareness, but also learning about what is a functional relationship. So I think if you can teach someone those things through surfing, amazing. Yeah, it, you nailed it. That's it exactly. And, and for sure, like going through that, I think I had gone from like childhood stuff into like pro surfing stuff into, okay, now I want to start this business and get married and all this stuff. And it was all about like, 
what do I need to do? Who do I need to be to make these people happy? Like as a child, it was like my parents. And then as a pro surfer, it was the surf industry. I have to look a certain way. I have to win the contest or I better come up with a good excuse why I didn't win the contest. And I got to be a model and I have to do all these things. You know? And so, yeah, it was really, it's really been an amazing journey the last few years to kind of say, no, I, I need to pull out of that, which was hard. No one in my family has ever been divorced. Like it was a big deal for me. I know for some people it's like, yeah, whatever divorce, 50% of marriages end in divorce these days, but I never got married thinking I was going to get divorced. So it was like a big deal for me to even like come around to the idea of like, I made these promises and I made this choice and this commitment and I now I'm going to pull out of that. Like it, I didn't take it lightly. It took me years to actually get there, but then it's like, Oh my God, what a relief. Okay. Now I'm going to be single and I'm going to redefine like who I am. And I think that's also the benefit to not only therapy, but also getting older. Like, you know, once you turn 40, there's something about turning 40 where you're like, wait a minute, I don't really even care what these other people think. Like, who do I want to be? How do I want to live? And, and in going through the counseling process and learning about it, like, Oh my God, I learned so much about myself and my patterns and the people around me. And, um, and I'm learning every day through clients as well, because like in talking through somebody else, I'm like, Oh, I see part of me in that. Like, hmm, I, I recognize that pattern. And it's almost easier sometimes to like address it with somebody else than it is with yourself. I feel like too. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a great experience. It's a long journey, but chugging along. Well, it re- reminds me of that saying: if if you see some something with within someone else, it's it's in within it's within you as well. So every time you're coaching someone outside of you, you in some sort of way you are coaching yourself. And of course, you know if you've been through these types of experience, it's much easier to relate to to people. They're more likely to open up if you do. Let's bring it back to surfing, though. How was all, how was all this relationship experience and uh, counseling, etc., and learning about um, psychology? How has that affected your your personal relationship with the ocean? You know, in a funny way, I feel like it's helped me to not be such a surfing addict. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I, I think it's a lot of things together, but I do feel like I've learned more tools to be able to be more self-aware and, um, yeah, like I don't need surfing as much as I used to. Like, obviously I I love it and it feels so good to do it, but I feel like that, that need that I used to have where if I didn't go surfing, I just like couldn't deal with struggle. I feel like I've gotten past that in the same, in, in, to that extreme, like obviously when I'm when I'm upset, yes, my default is I want to go surfing, but I don't necessarily feel like I need to I need to go surfing in order to maintain baseline anymore. So that that has been really helpful. And and even in in dealing with jerks in the water, you know, like the aggressive jerk in the water, I'm so much more likely now to be looking at that guy and going, "Wow, he must be going through a lot right now. Like he clearly needs this wave more than I do." And I'm just going to make way rather than being like, oh, this guy, like this idiot out here, like I'm going to show him, you know, like I maybe used to do. Um, And and just being more appreciative of being in the water, like because I for sure, like especially as having that passive of pro surfing, like there is that part of me that still has that self-worth element that's tied to my performance, like even now. And, you know, I I think as a kid, I had like no self-confidence and then I developed surfing and that was where I got like attention and, and whatever, like outside of my family. And then I was good at it and I got, you know, I was paid to do it and all of this. So like all of these good things came to me from feeling like I was surfing well. And it, it is hard to like let go of that. And, and especially as a woman, like I'm so used to being like the best girl in the water and there's like a, you know kind of an element of like, yeah, I'm awesome, you know, that comes from surfing well. And then you have those days where you don't surf well, for whatever reason, you're tired, or you just like you're out of sync, and you fall off and people are watching. And, you know, that kind of thing used to affect me more than it does now. So having gone through this process, it my surfing is, is, I would say more mellow, like where it used to be so like, I need it. And if it doesn't go the way I want, like, ugh, you know, and this guy ugh, and like the crowd, oh my God, you know, and now I'm just like, I'm a little bit more chill. Like I definitely still get really excited. 
<laughs> my friends are always like, Holly, wow, chill. But it's it's more it's more mellow. I don't get like the big extremes up and down. I'm like excited or I'm just cruising. And if I'm not having a good one, I just go in. You know, like I have no shame in paddling in. Like if I get to the point where I'm like, I'm not having fun. I'm not going to stress about getting that last wave. Like, that's something that my friends always trip out on. Like, I was recently in the Mentawise, and, you know, the boat comes, and people are out there, like, all this anxiety. Like, oh, i got to get a wave to get to the boat. Like, I can't paddle in. And I'm like, why not? I'm just going to paddle in. I'm done. And and it's funny that I feel like that has been as a result of, of doing this work. Hmm. So it sounds like you are more in control of surfing Whereas previously, maybe surfing had a little control over you. I, I think that's accurate. I don't even know that I'm in control of surfing. I think I'm just in more in control of myself. And and like I was saying earlier, like the emotions will co- would come out in surfing in a way that I feel like is not as socially acceptable to have come out in other ways. Like the jerk that we talked about earlier that maybe had a lot of pent up anger at home, but felt like he couldn't yell at his wife or his kids or whatever. But then in the water can yell at the ocean because it's like almost like a safer place to just express those emotions. And in the same way, like I would have all this stuff going on inside that I felt like I had to just like bottle up. But then I would go out in the ocean and just, you know, like it would all come flying out, which, you know, is the therapeutic aspect of surfing, right? Is that you can get those emotions out But I feel like now I'm just a little bit better at if I start to get upset or agitated or depressed or whatever those emotions are, I'm better able to like address it and be like, okay, I feel off. What is it that I need? And I'm going to figure out how to give myself that so that it doesn't get to be such a big feeling. And and that helps me in my day to day life. And it, it also helps me in my surfing. So the the way that you describe the, I I guess, would you, is is it fair to say that your relationship to the ocean and surfing has improved? Yes. Do you think as you're going along that journey with the ocean, is it reflected in your personal relationships? I think so. I do think so. Yeah. How does surfing um, help your personal relationships? Like how, how is it, how does that happen? For me personally? Sure. Or a client, if you want to use an example. I I think in the past, surfing helped my personal relationships because it was an outlet for emotions that I didn't feel able to deal with on land. And, and so it was, I was able to like soothe myself in the water, which then made me a better, you know, partner or parent or whatever. And, and I think that now I have learned other tools so that now surfing doesn't have to have all that pressure. Now surfing to me is more just fun. Like obviously it feels good, but it really, it, it's, it's interesting. And you know, I, it's almost like I didn't really fully understand that until I'm talking it through. Cause I haven't really talked about it. Like I've noticed that I don't need to surf as much as I used to. And I, I had kind of phrased it as like, Oh, well I've just gotten more used to not surfing. Cause I just spent, 10 months in California where I barely was able to surf at all. And there were a lot of hard times as a result of that, but I got through it. And now that I'm here in Costa Rica and actually the kids are with dad right now. And I could, I could have surfed today, but I didn't because I felt like I had other things to do and there's a big swell coming and I'm just going to save it. But in the past, like I would have had to surf today. And so it's almost like surf. My relationship with the ocean has changed in the fact that it is not as crucial I still love it. I still enjoy it. It still gives me all the benefits, but I don't need it like I used to. And when you do go surfing, do you find you you surf better because of that? No, maybe I don't know. Maybe I don't. Probably don't surf as well because I'm not going as frequently. You know how it is when you go every day and you're like in tune with the mm. ocean and your body and the boards and in shape. Like, well, maybe a better question is: Do you enjoy the surfing experience more? I think so. Yeah. There's not as much. Like I said, it more feels like a bonus. It doesn't feel like something I have to have. And if it doesn't go well, I'm mad. Now it's like, I'm just happy to be out there. Do you feel the same way about personal relationships now as well? Maybe so, actually. Maybe so. Like for a long time in my life, I felt like I had to have a partner. Like I had like that defined me. Like I needed that like validation 
from the other human, like the, the text messages and like somebody has chosen me and like that validation was important to me. And, and having gone through a long time being single and getting used to that and like choosing that, then I sort of lost that need, that constant need for validation. So now the relationship that I'm in now, I don't feel the need for that validation as much. And it, it's, it's a bonus. It's more a bonus. Yeah. And it's enjoyable. And yeah, he's, he's in San Diego and I'm in Costa Rica and I miss him and I'm excited for him to come. But like, it's not the same like need that I, that I used to have. Like where in the past, like I would, you know, I would have a hard time staying in a committed relationship if he was far away because I need that. So I would be like looking for that validation here. Is it, is it the most functional relationship you've ever been in? Well, it's, it's early days now, so we'll see. But I think so. I think so. He's also, I think I've also chosen differently, you know, in, in the past. And maybe it's kind of all related because in the past it was like relationships were like a means to an end. Like I need validation and then, oh, I need to get married and have kids because I want to have kids. So I got to find someone that's going to achieve that for me. And now it's like, I don't need anything. I'm financially stable. I've already had children. I've already been married. I don't have that, like, I need to get married or I need to someone to support me or whatever. I've lived by myself. And so now it really is more about just, like, I want a companion to enjoy life with. But it's okay if we're not together for two months. Yeah, see, your surfing reflects life and life reflects your surfing. <laughs> right. Definitely. You're good. So you just did a retreat recently. Do you had some, some, some clients come down to where you are now, I'm assuming? That's right. And how did that go? Oh, it was amazing. I, I mean, I've been running women's surf and yoga retreats for 12 years. You know, I feel very comfortable in that space. And, and I feel like it's, it's always transformative for people just to spend a week where they get to focus on themselves and, you know, leave jobs and families at home and, and I, I think the interesting thing about about women's surf retreats, too, is that like our team, we've created this culture of like support and empowerment. So we're just like all day like, you're awesome. Like, that was amazing. Like, epic wipeout. You know, like everything is all real positive. And I, I feel like people getting the chance to spend a week with, you know, all these rad women telling them that they're awesome. Like, when does that happen in life? Like, you know, um, so that part is good, too. But this retreat was different because we were approaching it holistically. So we were doing these workshops where we were tying in a surf element with a mental health element. Like, for example, we did a lecture on like how to read a surf forecast. So we talked about, you know, the, the actual surfing forecast and where do those numbers come from? And there's buoys out there and the wind blows on the surface of the ocean and creates swell and the buoy measures them and they spit it out into a computer program and blah, 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 right? And this is how you do it. Because a lot of women that come on these retreats, like, they don't know what the period means. You know, like, they just look at the surf line, like, summary of it's going to be two to three and it's green, you know. But they don't necessarily understand the difference between a two foot at 13 seconds and a two foot at 17 seconds swell. So the point is to, like, teach them that. Um, and then what do you do with that information? If you know that there's a big swell coming, like, what will you do to prepare? You're going to, you know, get a lot of sleep and eat well and make sure you have your right board and plan where you're going to go. And so then tying it in to the mental health component, we have people visualize, like, what if you were your own home break? Imagine the various features that would be involved. Like for me, I have this bay and at one point there was a ship that was out there. That was my relationship. And then that ship sank and it was like very tragic at first, but now it's made this killer little point break. And so now I actually experience a lot of joy from having had that experience, right? So we ask everybody to kind of consider like their own emotional home break and what are the features and then forecasting the storm that comes like there's a storm out to sea, stress, job stuff, you know, political drama, whatever the news. And here comes this wave of emotion and being aware of our own individual features and how that's going to impact us. And so maybe there's like childhood trauma, shallow reef in my cove but not in my friend's cove so that swell that comes in is going to make a big emotional reaction on my coast but not hers so it's kind of that like you said therapy is self-awareness 
And so it's being aware of what are the features in my life that are like triggers that can cause me to have this big wave of emotion. And then knowing that that might be coming, what am I going to do to prepare in order to be able to ride that wave of emotion and maybe even find joy in it or at least not get like taken out? So we have like various little workshops like that. And then there's awesome discussions that come as a result. So I think people left the week with, aside from just like, you know, improving their surfing and getting to spend a week in Costa Rica riding horses and going on jungle hikes and, you know, being told they're awesome, to also leaving with this like enhanced level of self-awareness. But it's all in the context of surfing. So I feel like it feels, you know, therapy can be kind of heavy. And and even though here we are talking about it, there's still that stigma associated with it. Like, it's not something that you necessarily, like, blast to everybody. Oh, yeah, last night I was talking to my therapist. You know, like, most people kind of keep it a little bit more down low. Or people think, like, I encountered a lot of people who are like, oh, I don't need therapy. Yeah, I just have the normal anxiety, depression stuff. But, like, I don't need therapy. But it's like, well, everyone can benefit from self-awareness. So it's kind of a way of sort of sneaking in that like therapy aspect, but in the context of surfing, which makes it feel more fun and accessible. It's a, yeah, I like that. It's a great analogy of the, the swell coming in the bay and the preparation. And, and you, you're right about the, the stigma around therapy. I, mean, the ter- I think the term is, because of the stigma around the term, it's the wrong term to use because it's, it's more about, it, it is about self-awareness, but also psychological education. Yeah. And that's, if you want to be a better surfer, you have to be self-aware. Where are you at? What, what type of surfer are you today? And what do I need to learn to become better? Surfing awareness, ocean awareness, equipment awareness, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it's a great analogy. It's funny because if you don't, and if you don't have that preparation and, and education of that swells coming, and you turn up to the beach, oh, well, I'm ready, I'm ready. And then you look down and, oh, there's no leash string. Oh, and it ruins everything because right. you did not think things through. Now, there's probably a way around it. You borrow someone's, but at the moment, it might stress you out. And that might affect when you do finally paddle out, that one mishap of the half an hour delay and trying to find a, a string for your leash, it's ruined everything. And you learn from those experiences. So next time the big swell comes... You listen to Holly and you do your preparation properly. <laughs> or if you go through that moment and you don't have your leash string and you stressed out, now you're on this stress moment, you don't paddle straight out. You take that moment and you ground yourself. And so it's like teaching those tools as well. Like what do you do when you feel all like frantic and whatever and now you need, you know, things went, something went wrong, but you still have to perform. How do you relax? How do you become aware of your internal state and change it so that you can focus on the next thing so it's it's that psychoeducation of like what are the tools in your toolbox and, and the, the stigma around therapy i mean it's less i mean a city like los angeles it's 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 not a thing it's not so much as a, a stigma it's almost accepted and expected almost um but for, certainly for um, you know i'm sure you don't not all your clients are from are living in la but do, do you think there's a similar stigma around the surf coaching I don't know, actually. That's a good question. I, you know, it's, I, I think I think that there's a gender difference because I have noticed too in our retreats that we'll you know, we do have some co-ed retreats because people want to bring their partners or brothers or best friends or whatever. We just guys are like, I want to do it. Um, and I have noticed that it's a lot more common for me to get an email was like, I want to come with my wife on this retreat, but I don't need coaching. You know, she needs coaching, but I don't need coaching. I just do my own thing. And I'm like, no, but I'm sure that unless you are Kelly Slater, you know, and even Kelly Slater probably gets some coaching, you know, like you want, you don't, you want to have video footage and don't you want to be guided to the best spot and told where to sit. And if the coach notices that you should put more weight on the front foot, wouldn't you be interested in hearing that? You know, but I, and I think that so that there is less stigma in help seeking among women than there is among men. Yeah, I, I, I think it's overall it's, I mean, 10 years ago, it was, it was worse, right? Yeah. Surf coaching. Oh, no. I don't know. It's need that. becoming more. Yeah. yeah, it's more. It's definitely more socially accepted nowadays. And I think what it sounds like what you're doing is so, I mean, 
awesome. That these trips sound amazing. I want to come. <laughs> come on down. Let's talk about it. It's so fun. Yeah, I, I did a similar one. I did so. I was in Nicaragua a couple of years ago with Taylor Knox and Matt Griggs. Oh, nice. The surfing therapy wasn't really discussed, but a big part of the trip was was meditation. Okay. And there was um, it was more of a, a men's thing. Um, the the men would get together. It was about ten of us, and we'd get in a little circle, and we would do a med- meditation. And, and Matt and Taylor would talk about, you know, um, I guess human psychology, I guess, and then that would open the discussion into. And it was a, an amazing trip. You know, it was an amazing trip. That's awesome. Yeah, those those two guys are both super cool. Is is meditation something that you include as your? In For your, sure. In your retreats as well. Yeah, definitely. We do. If, if if we're including it, it's more like guided meditation. That's like one of the one of the activities we do is is what's your magical surfer? Like if you could be any type of surfer, what would you be? And we guide them through the process because I think that, you know, I I see a lot of women that are like, I want to get down to a shortboard. I want to go shorter. I now I ride a, an eight foot, but I really want to go shorter. And that's like always a question of like, why do you want to go shorter? Is it because you feel like it's more cool, you know, like, or like, unless you live in New York city and you have to get to the beach on the subway and you need a short board so that you can do that easier. Like, okay, I get it. But otherwise it's like, why is that? And, and I feel like it's interesting, like going through that meditation, like people don't necessarily know what we're doing. Like I don't tell them this is what we're going to do. We just like start this. Okay. Follow along with me and see where you end up. And, and then at the end it's like, okay, what did you come up with? Like if in your fantasy surf session, what were you doing? How were you interacting with the ocean? What did your board look like? And and I feel like sometimes people surprise themselves. I notice when I do it, I get a different answer every time because it's more based on like my mood. Like sometimes I want to be out there getting so barreled and other times I just want to stand there and glide. Um, but I, I feel like people like they, if you ask them, what are your goals in surfing? The answer is a lot of times based on other people's perceptions of like, that looks cool. I want to do that. When you really guide them through, like, what does their body actually want? What do they actually want? Sometimes the difference is like, I just want to enjoy myself in the water. I just want to glide, you know? And so it's like, okay, well then let's figure out what board is going to get you to that goal. Yeah. Yeah. Often people don't really think it through and we, yeah, there's that stigma around, of course, you know, cause you look at the WSL and if if that's what professional or high level surfing is, fair enough. But I, I've always I see surfing as less of a sport and more like music. Whereas, okay, sure, the WSL that's your hard, fast jazz. But then look at Devin Howard. I mean, he's just as good a surfer. It's just he's he's more into the slow jams. Yeah, right. He's just as he's just as good a musician, technically. The way he reads a wave, the way he deals with a lineup, etc. It's just his style of surfing is much different. So I'm always helping clients, you know, stop looking at Kelly Slater and, and Dane Reynolds and you know, take a look at some of the other surfers, the alternative boards. They may not have even been exposed to or know that that exists. They don't, totally. And sometimes I find also a lot of surfers, a lot of my clients in the past, they, they don't even watch surfing at all. They just go surfing. So they actually don't have an idea of, of what to look, uh, you know, a surfing mentor or whatever. So sometimes just making them realize that, you, like, you're right, it's not just Kelly Slater. There is, there's lots of other different types of surfers out there surfing all sorts of surfboards. And, and nowadays that, that footage is so accessible. Yeah, right. There's fewer excuses for not being exposed to it now. You just have to go and look. But I think, yeah, I think we need mentors in, in all aspects of our lives, really. Like even if you've got, a, if you've got a, a therapist, their knowledge of human psychology is something to look up to. Or at least you, it should be if that's the... Yeah. And if it's not, then, if it's not, then maybe choose a different therapist. But <laughs> Well, I think also just focusing on the individual is something that... Because it's like, okay, if you just all look at Kelly Slater, then it doesn't matter who you are, you want to be Kelly Slater. But it's like looking at the individual, like where do you surf? How much time do you have to surf? What do you want? What are your goals and dreams? What are the feelings that you want to have in the water? And what board is going to make the spot that you surf and how frequently you surf 
get closest to that feeling. You want this feeling, you want to be challenged. Okay, fine. Perfect. If you're, you know, I spoke to a, a client today that's coming on a retreat soon. And she was telling me how she lives in Chicago. She doesn't surf very often, but her goals are to feel challenged. Like she wants to struggle because that's where she gets joy. But she goes on, she went on a retreat and they put her on a nine foot board. They're like, well, you live in Chicago and you've only surfed once. So you're going to be on a nine foot board. And she's like, but I didn't feel yeah, I've got long waves, but I didn't feel challenged. So it's like finding, like rather than me say, you live in Chicago, this is your height and weight, you've surfed four times in your life, this is the board for you. It's like, no, well, what are your goals? What are what feeling are you looking to have? And then let's find the board that's going to give you that feeling or, you know, help you get to that feeling versus just like, you're just, this is the numbers and this is what you get. And what, so what are, let's ask you a shallow question. What are some of the most common mistakes that you see the average surfer make? I do a lot of coaching and I would say that to almost every single person, well, I, you know, I'm not coaching WSL surfers. I'm coaching like the average, the average surfer. The most common thing I say to people is first, like figuring out the pop-up because people have really crazy pop-up habits that they developed early on. And and just evaluating the pop-up and it's like, is it a physical limitation that's causing you to do that? And if so, then let's just have compassion for ourselves and understanding and embrace that. But most of the time it's a habit. So working on the pop-up technique is the first thing. The second thing is more weight on the front foot. Like so many people have a tendency to be on their back foot, even like intermediate surfers that are like trying to learn how to get barreled and they pull into the tube and they're all so back. You know, so really like embracing the assertiveness of the front foot and then look at the wave, like the actual wave. Right. It's amazing to me how many novice, advanced beginner, even early intermediate surfers, even my boyfriend, as he's paddling for the wave, he looks straight at the beach. I'm like, why are you looking at the wave? He's an excellent surfer. He's been surfing his whole life. He surfs really well, but he's not looking at the wave on the takeoff. It trips me out. And I just feel like. Like, why would you not look at the wave? Like, that's the, the, you should be looking at the wave the entire time. Like, that's where you're getting your, your information on what's coming next. Yeah, those are good tips. I think it's often the, the, a mis, a mishap in one's perspective of surfing because we all often surfers think that surfing starts when we stand up, but it actually starts when you start paddling. You've got to start reading the wave as you're paddling, and the pop up is the first and arguably the most important maneuver. For sure. And you should be looking at the wave while you're doing it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, you get the pop-up, right? It's like singing a song. You've got to hit that first note. That's right. Your feet, your feet land in the right place. You, you entered the wave correctly. You taught the timing of your pop-up, etc. Yeah. And even for like advanced surfers, I would say like surfing like more critical wave, like you better be looking at that curve from the very start, from the whole time. And in order to set that rail and be charging down the line and... Yeah, like I said, I was recently in the in the Mentwise, and I was like watching these other surfers. They're good surfers. They're not beginners. You know, we were surfing macaronis, and it was good. And I was just like, you know, I have a hard time turning off the surf coach mind. <laughs> and I was just like watching these people take off, and I was just like, wow, they're not looking at the wave. No wonder they're having a hard time pulling into the barrel. They're not looking at it. Yeah, no, there's, there's so much in surfing. And that, that's the coolest thing about surfing is there is no, there's no limit no matter who you are. I mean, Kelly Slater is still wants to get better and he can get better. You know, there's still waves that are going to challenge him. He can go, and he's seeking those waves and those situations. It's it, the surfing journey near, and there's, or there's a different board he could learn, learn to ride. Um, so surfing is, there's so much to surfing. It's not one thing. It's so dynamic. It's so broad. It's such a, it's so much more than a sport. Yeah. And that's what makes it so fun. Um, your parents as well. I'm a parent. Your kids surf? They do. Yeah. yeah. They are uh, They are about to turn six and eight. Older girl, younger boy. And I surfed when I was pregnant. My son caught his first wave when he was four months old, just like sitting in my lap on a longboard that my friend pushed us into a wave. And I surfed with them on my shoulders when they were big enough that they could hang on. I would like practice on land I would put them piggyback on my shoulders but then I wouldn't hold on to them and I would like swing around and make them hold on I was like watch the monkeys you know the mama monkey with the baby on the back jumps from tree to tree I'm like we can do this 
And, uh, and then, yeah, as they got a little bit bigger, then I would start with them on my shoulder and like swing them around to the front of the board with me so that they would like standing on the board as well. And then as they got bigger, then they would lay on the board and I would pop up and then help them to their feet. Um, and then last year they both got really into boogie boarding. So riding their own waves. And then now they're both stand up surfing and they're little, but he's my son. He's so skinny and little. He's so light. He doesn't really have like the strength or the weight to like paddle himself out past the waves but he can paddle out and turn around the whitewash and stand up and ride into the beach and my daughter she's not like she only wants to do it on her terms so she doesn't want to go every day but then there'll be days that she'll surprise me and be like I want to go surfing I'm like okay let's go um I try to really hard not to like push it which has been a challenge for me at times but because uh, I'm like oh it's so good for you it's perfect out there look there's that other little girl out there like let's go come on it'll be so fun and and she resists, and I it actually, on Mother's Day this year, the kids were asking me, like, what do you want for Mother's Day? What should we do for Mother's Day? And I was like, I want to go surfing with you guys. That's what I want for Mother's Day. And we went to, we went on a camp out. There was, like, a bunch of other moms and kids, and the waves were maybe not ideal for it, but they were good, decent waves for it, and, and my daughter just really didn't want to go. And, and finally, she said to me, I really want to make you happy, but I don't want to surf. And I just like felt this like, Oh man. Okay. All right. You don't have to surf. Like you don't, I love you. You make me happy. Like it's fine. And after that, I felt like I saw this shift that all of a sudden when she felt like she didn't have to, then she was like, okay, I want to. Cause just before that, she had told me at one point that she hated surfing and I was like, Oh no. Um, so it was a good lesson to like really not have that expectation and, they're going to get into surfing if they get into surfing. And if they don't, that's fine too. But I accept them for who they are. I'm trying to like do it differently from the way I was parented. And it's hard because, you know, I, you have those patterns ingrained in you. And I do find myself reacting to the kids sometimes the way that I was reacted to. And it's those times that I have to like kind of stop and, you know, go, okay, I'm going to use my tools here. I'm very frustrated and annoyed because kids are annoying. But I'm going to take some breaths and it's not about them. You know, it's just about me and how do I calm myself down so that I can then address their needs. So I'm working on it. It's a struggle though. Yeah. Okay. Well, it sounds like you're pretty self-aware and you're just, it's just like, it's a, it's a give and take sort of thing. Exposing, you want to expose them to surfing because you want them to feel safe in the ocean and, and understand the joys of the pastime. But you, but you're right at the same time, as soon as you start to push them, they're like, nah. Yeah. No. Well, and sometimes like she'll be like, I don't want to go to the beach. I'm like, come on, we're going to the beach. I don't want to. And I'm like, come on, we're going, we're going. And then we get to the beach and all of a sudden she's playing and laughing and whatever. And I'm like, see, you know, so it's like some yeah. element, some <laughs> element of pushing is necessary, but it's just knowing when to be like, okay, fine. We're not going to the beach today. We don't have to. Probably a lot, a lot of listeners who, you know, uh, love surfing and want their kids to at least enjoy the experience of being in, near the ocean. What's the worst thing someone could do to inhibit their children having a relationship with the ocean? I mean, I, I think for me, the things that I've noticed is like if you if the kid thinks that gaining your affection is is the way that they're going to get that is by doing it, because then even if they do do it, they're doing it for the wrong reason. They're doing it because you want them to. They're not developing their own enjoyment of it. And then even if they do it for years, then it may end up backfiring eventually. Like I have, I have friends whose parents surfed and, you know, took them to the beach all the time and they surfed a bit when they were young and then they stopped surfing and didn't surf because they were like, oh, that's my parents thing and they wanted me to do it and I'm over it. Whereas like I was the opposite, like I didn't get a chance to do it. So it was like all I wanted to do. So I think it's just like trying to find that balance of, like you said, introducing it, showing it, but not forcing it. Then warm water helps. Warm water helps so much. My kids did not want to surf in California. My son would a little bit, but not really because he would just get cold and the wetsuit's so such a pain to like wrestle the little wiggly body into you know but now that we're here in warm water it's so much easier have you read any decent parenting books you know when the kids were babies i read a bunch of books i read everything that i that came across my path i don't know that there was any that that were super helpful that i would like recommend but i think the most important thing is self-awareness if you're aware of your own triggers and your own emotions and the way that 
your emotions are affecting your behavior that I feel like that's the most important thing. Like whether it's about surfing or parenting or, or whatever, it's like, I've noticed that the moments that I make mistakes and do something that then I regretful later, it's always when like I lost my calm. And so as long as I could stay calm and like rational, then I'm good with, as far as parenting goes, you know, the kids having a tantrum. And if I can stay calm then I can be aware of this is just a little human with undeveloped, you know, cognitive processing and they're having a big emotion that they don't know how to control. So I have to be the one that can control my emotions. But if I get lost and like, oh, we got to go now, you know, I'll get your shoes on. We're out of here. You know, it's like that was me losing my cool. So it's really it's not about the, the kid. It's about me. Totally. Yeah. Because the kids pick up on even the most subtle whatever's within you and then they just don't want to be around you so then it's like oh so you're right it's it that's the best parenting advice that's the best summary of all the parenting books i've read as well how how old are your kids i've got three boys uh, six seven and ten okay so yeah right in the same range and do they serve yeah they do yep nice yep they do they i never push them though i just expose them to it and always just wanted them to enjoy the experience of being at the beach, really. And, you know, sometimes they don't. And sometimes they, they want to go. And my younger two, they're bodyboarding mostly. And I just let them do that. They yeah. just, just come and have some fun. And, yeah, my eldest one, a 10-year-old, he loves surfing. But not in winter. They don't even bother in winter. Right. But in the in the summertime. We, 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 we were living... Uh, we were down at Zuma Beach in Malibu. Okay. every Every day. Every day as they were growing up. So... They, they got exposed to a nice part of the world and beautiful beach. And before right. that, we were in, in Sydney, Australia, with nice warm water in the summer as well. So, yeah, the warm water thing helps a lot. For sure. And Zuma's not that warm in the su- Even in the summer, it's not that warm. I don't. Yeah, you still need a, wet, a wetsuit. But, the, you know, the atmosphere is yeah. nice and warm and it's a, it's a beautiful spot. So Yeah. And um, they've spent quite a bit of time in New Zealand, which is a lot colder than, than Zuma in Sydney. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So it's warm for them. It's it's certainly not tropical Costa Rica, but uh, yeah, it's warm enough. Definitely warm for them. How often are you running these retreats? Well, the normal service of the Muse retreats are going year round and pretty much almost every week. And we have a bunch of different locations oh, wow. all over the world. We do Nicaragua, Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, Morocco, Indonesia. That's probably one I'm forgetting, but yeah, uh, we, I have team everywhere, kind of just running them in season. Um, Costa Rica is definitely like our number one and we have multiple locations in Costa Rica, but the holistic surf coach, and we just did the first one a couple weeks ago and we're doing the second one starting on Saturday. And then there's one in Morocco in the fall and in Nicaragua in, uh, the spring. Oh, in Peru, that's the other spot. We're going to go to Peru. So yeah, they're, they're a little bit more, um, energy intensive. And we need more specific staff. I mean, I think at this point, like, the staff are what makes the experience. And so for the holistic surf coaching, it's just like a different caliber of staff that's also trained in, you know, trauma-informed. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be a therapist, but definitely someone open to, you know, being very trauma-informed and has to be, like, self-aware as well. So that's that's the limiting factor. And we're just kind of growing it and learning about it. Like, from the first one, you know, we got a lot of feedback and... We're going to, we refine things and now we're going to the second one and we're going to do some things a little bit differently. And so, yeah, it's, it's fun for me. It's really fun to do something different. Like I had spent, you know, a long time doing the same thing and, you know, obviously it grew and changed and developed and improved, but really I felt like I, the formula was there and it was like running and established and kind of was like just ready to take on a new challenge. So it's fun to have, even though it's like a similar similar product it's different and it's it's fun to have that challenge of doing something differently it's it's awesome it sounds amazing so how can people find out more about these trips and book surfwithamigos.com has all of that and then i have my own website i'm I'm kind of also in this like middle ground of deciding what to do with it so i just graduated like last week officially and and i've been so busy doing that that i haven't really had a ton of time to think about okay what's next and so I'm in this middle ground of trying to decide, like, does the whole culture of Surf with Amigas shift more toward these holistic surf retreats 
or is it just like a specialty series of retreats within Surf with Amigas? Or do I start something new that is not just retreats, but it's also, you know, workshops in California and individual clients and, and it's just more of the holistic side of things and maybe even calling it therapy sometimes. But like you said, I feel like that word needs to be adjusted. But yeah, I'm, I'm in this point of trying to figure it out. So the Surf with Holly Beck, uh, website is, is to kind of explore that avenue of doing just my own thing. Um, but in the meantime, because Surf with Amigas has all the stuff up and running and going, we're doing the holistic surf coaching through Surf with Amigas. So yeah, we'll see. But either one of those ways can, can be yeah. involved. And then I'm going to be in California, um, seasonally. So we'll be doing things in California as well. So if you don't want to commit to a full week of this and are in Southern and Northern California, I'm going to be in the Bay Area quite a bit this next year. So there'll be like one day um, experiences where you can just come and experience holistic surf coaching just for a session and see if you like it. Okay, awesome. I will put links to both those websites in the show notes. Thank you so much for your time, Holly. Thank you. I really, really enjoyed the conversation.